scaling of uh, processing of devices is central for moving uh, discoveries made in the laboratory and in universities into industry and uh, into our everyday life. And to give you an example of this, uh, I have here a uh, typical glass slide used in the majority of laboratories all over the world for testing small devices of polymer solar cells, of transistors, of uh, light emitting devices, etc. The majority of those uh, are processed using a spin coder, which I'll come back to in a minute. Of course, where we want to end up is something more scaled. Initially, small rolls like this of flexible foil. Later on, perhaps larger rolls like this one. And even later on, massive rolls that I wouldn't even be able to hold in my hand here, but that has to be handled by small trucks. Spin coating as a technique is a, a fantastic discovery. It is reproducible, parsimonious in many ways, in, not in terms of ink use, but in terms of the area that you process. And that means that it has uh, not only developed, but also spread uh, within especially the academic environment, because it's an affordable machine, and the uh, laboratory footprint of the spin coder is also very small, and the requirements for its operation are very small. And therefore, it is uh, one of the preferred techniques. It also works in a multitude of environments inside a glove box. It can also, it can even work on a normal bench or inside a fume cupboard. In the spin coating process, uh, when the film is formed, you apply the ink to the fastest spinning surface. And the majority of the ink is actually lost to the surroundings. And from this point of view, the, the spin coating technique is not in any way scalable. Whenever patterning is required, in, as is the case for the majority of organic electronic components, such as transistors, memory elements, OLEDs, um, or solar cells, uh, you will need to structure the uh, film after you've formed it using spin coating. And this is, of course, a, a drawback that uh, in probably not exclusively, but, but in the majority of cases uh, ma makes the use of, of spin coating uh, industrially impossible. The flexibility is not forcibly uh, a requirement in, in the final product, but it's certainly a requirement for the fast manufacture. And it is by many viewed as a desirable asset of the organic electronics uh, portfolio of uh, devices that they can be applied in a flexible form, not only during manufacture but also in use. But the majority of the importance of this flexibility lies in the fact that it enables fast roll-to-roll -roll manufacture. The roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing method uh, is truly scalable in the sense that the, the footprint of the uh, film application method, whether it be flexo or slot die or rotary screen or gravure or any number of these film forming techniques that, that are used in, in roll to roll uh, based methodologies. The footprint of the, of the printing head or the printing unit is typically roughly constant. So it's roughly the same size and of course scales with the width of the, of the foil that you process. But when it comes to, to the, uh, the processing speed, this depends of course a little on, on the method itself, but uh, it can be scaled easily by simply cranking up the speed of the web that you are printing on within the limits of the technology and of course of your drying unit and all your foil handling uh, machinery that is behind the printing head. Now the process of taking a laboratory salt such as, as this spin coated, small spin coated device and bringing it to a larger scale, ideally something like this as I said before or something even larger um, is of course easier said than done. In principle, it's, it's a simple operation. You simply take your ink that worked well with spin coating and you apply it uh, in your roll-to-roll -roll printing machine. And in principle, it should work straight away. In actual fact, it is not the case. There's a lot of, of um, uh, aspects in the film forming process that makes spin coating very forgiving and you easily oversee a lot of these requirements uh, that, are, that, that the roll-to-roll -roll philosophy imposes on successful uh, manufacture of a given device in a roll-to-roll, -roll, in a fast roll-to-roll -roll setting. But it's clear when, when going from the small spin-coated glass slide to the roll of foil, uh, the scale is, is obvious. Uh, 
uh, its orders of magnitude, and, and it's clear that the equipment required in this scaling process has to somehow scale accordingly. And in principle, or ideally, it would be nice to take, go straight from the spin coder to the last large industrial machine. In practical terms, this is, has proven very difficult or, or impossible, and therefore you need a number of intermediate machines that does away with some of the forgiving features that, that spin coding presents and gradually transfers you from the spin coding setting to the complex industrial roll to roll setting. It's clear that, that this scaling, uh, just as the device gets bigger, the machine gets bigger. And, and, and this scale goes from the spin coder, which I can hold in my hand, to, for instance, this small micro roll to roll coder that we built uh, mainly for uh, studies using x rays or other uh, thin film physical characterization methods. And it enables slot die coding, for instance, uh, and you can study the liquid film formation. Um, and the drying processes using a number of, of uh, physical probes. And you can see here already, it's a little heavier than the spin coder. It's roughly the same size, maybe a little bigger, but certainly it's gone up a little in scale. And now the foil is on rolls. So the substrate is a rolling substrate that passes through mach the machine as you form your film and uh, study it. The next step up, uh, and I'll come back to why it looks the way it does, is something like the mini roll coder that I have here on my left. This is something that, or machine, that we built uh, some years back. Uh, initially, we um, had, a, as always, a prototype shown a little in front of me, and then later on, a more uh, evolved version, more compact, slightly more compact. But as you, as you can see, it is now so big that I probably could shift it with my hands, but it is unlikely that I could lift it. So the footprint is, even though it's relatively similar to a spin coder, it is a larger footprint and it is certainly heavier to operate. On my right here, we have the next step up in scale. And we'll come back to the details of this machine also. But just to illustrate it, it is now a larger machine. It uh, is one I can move. It has wheels on it, so I can shift it physically. But it's now roughly the size of a fume cupboard and, and thus significantly larger in scale. So now we've moved from something the size of your hands to something the size of, of um, a little larger than a fume cupboard. And uh, of course, the scale doesn't end there. Now returning to the film forming method, I mentioned before that during spin coating, you have a fastly spinning substrate. And as you apply your ink, the, uh, the wet layer thickness of your ink is defined by the, the shear field. So the rotational speed, it's coupled to. Uh, and the rate of evaporation, more or less. So in principle, you can predict your, uh, your thickness from viscosity and the, the rheology of your ink and the spin speed. And for a large part, you get an, a very homogeneous film thickness over a large area. Now, during spin coating, you don't have a lot of problems that you have the moment you move away from, from spin coating. Critical to uh, film forming, using low viscosity inks that we typically work with in organic electronics is that they are very sensitive to the static electric field. And also for spin coating, you can actually do a multi-layer process stack without touching the surface of your film. So suppose you form one film and you want to, well, with one layer, layer one, and you want to apply layer two on top. You can actually do this without damaging or, hurt or, or harming your surface, and at least you can eliminate the possibility that your processing method uh, has somehow resulted in destruction of the fine surface of the just processed film. And in that way, with the spin coder, it's possible to make multi-layer stacks of 10 or more layers with perfect interfaces. Now, the step in scale from the spin coding setting with, with these uh, brilliant uh, properties to something that is more akin uh, to, to the roll-to-roll -roll process on flexible foil uh, is a challenge. And therefore, I, uh, some years ago, uh, invented what uh, later became the mini roll coder, and it's in its prototypical form, it's standing here. So basically what it is, it is a drum. It has a circumference of an exactly one meter. So it enables you to take a piece of flexible foil, like this. This is flex throat. So it's a 
complex two-dimensional pattern electrode structure, has a printed a flexor printed silver grid, the rotary screen printed P dot, and in this case a slot die coated zinc oxide layer. And this is for solar cells. And it's a semi-transparent conductor that you can then apply. You can cut off one meter, apply it to this roll. And it's of course being a metallic roll. It's an aluminum roll. It allows you to heat it up. So you can heat this roll to a temperature, of course, that is sustained by the substrate or the flexible foil. And the advantage here is that the electric field, the static electric field, is constant. So you get pretty close to the conditions you have when you spin coat. So you have no shear once you have deposited your wet, fil wet film. This is in stark contrast to spin coating where static fields are not so critical because you have a, a very large shear field that uh, due to the rotational action of the spin coater. That, so if there is any static charging effects, that has a tendency to push your liquid ink around and change your, your film thickness. The shear field evens this out. The moment you go to a flexible foil with typically an insulating structure and some conducting structures on it, then the static electric field becomes extremely critical. So what I wanted was to enable a roll-like processing on flexible substrates where we have removed the possible adverse effects of a varying static electric field on low viscosity inks. Now in addition to this simple roll, uh, then of course there's a motor on it that allows you to spin the roll. And that means that you have with a web speed that of course will be relatively slow compared to industrial high speed roll to roll manufacture, uh, you are limited to web speeds of between zero and two meters a minute. But this is more than plenty of uh, processing window uh, for you to move from the spin coating environment to closer to a roll to roll environment and certainly onto a flexible substrate. And also in terms of area, a significantly larger area. You move from a few square centimeters for spin coating to more than or several thousand square meters uh, on this roll alone. The, the roll can be heated and it is, was in its original form uh, developed for slot die coating using a mini slot die coating head such as this one that is simply mounted here and then you can of course with these controls move your slot die coating head close to the film and control your meniscus while coating. Now, of course, when you develop something like this, uh, it doesn't end there. And this initial uh, mini roll coder uh, was evolved, and there were many uh, developments and redevelopments. Uh, for instance, uh, the original version here enabled the processing of all layers of, a, for instance, a solar cell stack, except the back electrode. And one of the developments uh, we made for the slightly revised version that we have here, it's a slightly smaller footprint, but technically it's the same uh, same machinery as, as the original prototype. But the most important one was that we developed a very simple flexo-like uh, uh, printing system that enables us to, uh, to print metallic or metal paste back electrodes, typically silver paste formulations. It can be either thermally cured or UV cured silver paste formulations. And since the, the roll here is only one meter long. It allows you to make a very simple flexo uh, operation where you just load this roller. This is a typical uh, piece of a flexo sleeve from, from a typical professional flexo machine. Uh, you just load this with silver and you have just enough silver on this uh, stencil to coat for one meter and then you have to reload. But it is a significantly more simple uh, printing uh, should we say printing uh, machine than then a real flexo machine that typically has four rollers uh, that are all driven. And here the driving of the uh, flexo roller here is, is carried out by the drum. So you could say the foil and the drum drives the flexo printing form. In terms of processing time, the mini roll coder is, is similar or maybe slightly faster than, than uh, processing time for using spin coating where typically you need an, a high vacuum evaporation step of a metal electrode or an oxide layer. Uh, and, and for the mineral coder, you can, uh, on the scale of one to two hours, make a complete device stack, including the back electrode. But still, a processing turnover time of one to two hours, of course, implies that, that uh, sometimes you, you get a queue, at least if you have one machine, 
And in this lab, we have we have four of them, and um, they that is roughly what is needed for for having a, a constant flow. And you can have the uh, process different layers on different machines to make it a little more expedient. So far, so good. So now we have scaled the equipment. We have several machines. We um, are actually able to more or less reproduce the results of spin coating on this drum. So now we are on flexible foil. We are handling liquid ink with static uh, shear field or no shear field. And we are able to, to uh, structure at least in one dimension here using a mini slot die coating head. Now the next step uh, further out of the comfort zone is of course going to moving foil, foil that moves over rollers in a full roll to roll setting. So from one roll with no print to another roll with a finished print, finished and dried film. And of course this requires foil transport. Foil transport means that foil has to roll over support and guiding rollers where the electric field is static with one fixed value, and then it's transported typically in free air, suspended in air uh, through the tension of the web to the next roller through the machine. And there's typically many rollers in such a machine, and the static fields may change a lot. And this is particularly challenging for wet films, as I said earlier, with low viscosity that in principle can move around. There's no reason the ink should move in response to a static field. Now, I'm going to take this machine and you'll notice that we are moving up in scale. I can still move it physically with my hands. And this larger machine that I in no way see as a replacement for the mini roll coder, it is the natural step up from the mini roll coder. Uh, and here we are introducing elements and things, issues that we didn't have to think about on the in spin coating or on the mini roll coder. First of all, when you have foil, running through a machine, you have to be able to control the way the foil runs over rollers. There's no guarantee that it will run straight. Therefore, first thing is you need an edge guide. So it's a set of rollers that can twist and control the direction of the foil. And there's typically an ultrasonic sensor that senses the edge of the foil. And if it moves to one side or the other, this platform rotates to counteract this. And that way you can have foil running straight through the machine. And this is of course important for registration of uh, your printed film. The next step is you need to control the speed accurately. And, and uh, for a roll to roll system, it's clear that on this roll it's not so obvious, but in a system when you start, you have all your foil on the unwinder and you have nothing on the rewinder over here. But as you process your film, the unwinder gets leaner and leaner and the rewinder gets richer, richer in foil. So that means that the winding diameter changes. And the, uh, this is a complex, so you cannot control the web speed through the rotational speed of the unwinder and the rewinder. And therefore, you typically operate those in tension mode. So basically, they simply follow something else that dictates the speed. And that way, you can handle a large change in, in roll diameter. This is handled, in this case, by a nip. So it's a driven roller and a rubber counter roller that simply control the foil transport. So that's a new, so not only do we have edge guide, we also now have a nip. Maybe you also need to condition the surface. In this case, it's a corona treater. So you have a plasma that oxidizes the surface and makes it some, in some cases you need, for instance, if you have inks with a higher surface tension, you need maybe to oxidize the surface slightly to wet better during drying. So then you also have this option. So this is three new things, four actually, if you count the winder and the unwinder and the rewinder, four new things that we didn't have to think about on the mini roll coder. So it's a already horrendously increased in complexity. The slot die coding head I showed earlier, the small mini slot die coding head, is exactly the same in principle and also in operation as on the mini roll coder. And uh, so from that point of view, there is no real change in moving from the mini roll coder to this uh, roll to roll machine, the small roll to roll machine, except of course this with the static fields that I mentioned. If I just move over here on the other side, uh, we also have a heated drum here, uh, significantly smaller than on a mini roll coder, but it's just to control or enable the control 
or eliminate the effect of the static field while scaling up. And this is, of course, uh, uh, needed in this scaling step. And increased complexity is, of course, also in this flexor printing unit. In principle, you can operate this machine uh, in a mini roll coder mode where you simply wind the foil around, and in that sense, it's completely identical to the mini roll coder, except it's a smaller roll. And uh, in practical terms, all this does is enable you to make sure that what worked on the mini roll coder also works on this machine before taking the larger step into the roll-to-roll -roll transport. Now, an additional complexity was in this flexor type uh, printing, where on the mineral quarter you could load a single cylinder with ink, and that would be enough for the one meter stretch that you have around the circumference. This, of course, also works on this machine if you have just foil wrapped around this roller. But uh, the intention of this machine is to run in a roll-to-roll -roll mode, uh, and there, uh, this simple flexo method is inadequate, and you need a real flexo. And here we built a simple two-roller uh, flexo, or three-roller flexo, if you count the, uh, the back backing cylinder uh, here, uh, where we have an analog roller here, and then we have the uh, printing form. And the analog roller enables you to constantly replenish the printing form with ink of the required wet thickness. And also, in the, on the mini roll coder, the uh, stencil here, or the printing form, is driven by the foil. In this case, you are actually uh, controlling the speed of the flexor drive, or flexor unit, through this motor, such that it matches the film exactly. So it's a more correct uh, flexor unit, more gentle to the film, a gentler print, better controllable, and of course it works for for, in principle, any, any length of foil. So now we've moved through some scales already. We've moved out of the comfort zone, gradually moved to a more and more complex setting. And just to summarize, on this machine, we have web handling, web conditioning, web transport. We have more complex printing units. And several, several dif difficulties has already been introduced. And you need to be able to, in an efficient scaling process, to address all these difficulties. And there's more to come. We're moving out of the laboratory environment, so where you can move around the objects you're operating with with your hands. It's typical, uh, significantly less than man size or, or close to man size, as the case of this small roll-to-roll -roll coder. I've shown you how you go from spin coding, how, you have, how we have a, a micro roll-to-roll -roll coder that I can hold in my hand. We can use for studying the film formation if there are differences between spin coding the mini roll coding or the mini roll to roll coding, uh, then we have developed methodologies for this. But the bigger scale is certainly less forgiving. We have in the laboratory changed the conditions so as to fit our purpose, which is of course to make it as easy as, as possible or as comfortable as possible for us to uh, approach the larger scale. But the large scale, as we will see, is truly unforgiving. And there, uh, where in the laboratory we control everything, in the large scale, we are controlled by the conditions and the environment that we have to operate in. So we've now moved up in scale. Not only the complexity of the machine has increased, and I'll go through it briefly in a minute. Also, the cost of operation has gone up, and certainly I'm no longer able to move the machine. I have to move around it, and also the, the foil we process on the machine uh, is larger in quantity, in width, and also already experienced and felt by the fact that I now need a trolley to shift and move a foil around. And on this roll, I have about 1.2 kilometers of foil with print on it. Now, the roll-to-roll -roll, uh, machine is not that different from the small roll-to-roll -roll code I showed you before, but there are some added features that are needed, and uh, those I will go through. First thing you will notice, we still have the unwinder as before. Same principles. We have an edge guide, a flexographic, four-roller flexographic printing station. Now we have a new thing we didn't have on the uh, small roll-to-roll -roll coder, is a web cleaning unit here. We still have the corona. And then we have a slot die coding head. It's a more complicated slot die coding head that allows for automatic registration. We have a hot air oven 
rotary screen printer, infrared drying, flash camera, another slot die coating unit, still with, with the um, camera uh, side registration, hot air oven, and then over here we have the outlet nib. We also have here a small inkjet printer for printing barcodes, an additional complexity of going up in scale when you have kilometers of foil suddenly you're processing. You need to know what you did when during the length of the foil and the only way to meaningfully uh, keep track of that is to print a unique number for every printed motif. And this uh, printed number, or this birth certificate for each piece of foil follows that piece of foil for the rest of the process. And this process may of course be a large number of steps. We may run the same foil through the same machine a number of times each time we have a passage we add another layer, another print, another functionality. This machine also has the capacity to print several layers at the same time. So it's an inline printer. We can do two printing operations in the same passage. And this is one philosophy of scaling up, is that during the same passage, you print at the same times, but in different uh, places in space. You have different printing stations that work together and you know printing station A prints layer A and printing station B prints layer B on top of um, layer A. We will see a little later as we scale up there's also another philosophy where the machines are not inline printers they are discrete printing units that can be operated in a discrete mode and they are positioned in the in the room such that they can the foil can either stay on the same machine or roll straight onto the next machine. And then typically you have a master-slave configuration where you have a master machine and all the others are operating in slave mode, making it in principle an inline printer just as this one. Now, an additional complexity of a machine such as this one, where you have inline possibility, is that you have multiple tension zones. So you're starting now to control the tension uh, of the foil in different sections through the machine. This also adds complexity. So just to summarize, from the spin coder, the mini roll coder, the micro roll to roll coder, the mini uh, roll coder and the mini roll to roll coder. Not only have we moved up in scale, we've added complexity such as web cleaning, multiple tension zones, multiple printing operations during the same passage, different drying methods, both hot air drying and infrared drying, and also new and more complex printing methods that has now a larger footprint. I can still operate them with my hand just to run through the, the printing uh, forms and, and methods that we have here. We have Flexo here. Now this is a four roller Flexo. You have a fountain roller that transfers the ink to an analog roller, which more which has a or an, ensures a constant loading in the number of cubic centimeters of ink you transfer to the printing roller uh, for every revolution. This replenishes itself all the time. And of course, there's a, an impression roller, a backing roller behind, so between the foil and the printing form. So there's four rollers in total. So the complexity has gone up. At the same time here, we now have registration. So we are actually capable of controlling the speed of this operation relatively to the, not the speed of the foil, but the motif on the foil. Foil may stretch, may compress, may contract, and that means that a printed motif that had a certain length before doesn't necessarily have it now. And for every printing step, this may change, and this you have to be able to handle. This can be handled by this machine. So it's a significantly more complex machine, the unit is, and also the weight of them, of those are now, I can still lift them with my hands, but it's more, not man size yet, but it's getting up in scale. Slot die coating head here, heavy steel, uh, and, and also more complex. You certainly don't want to drop it on your feet. And uh, more time consuming to clean up for all of them. Also here I have rotary screen printing, where you recognize the pattern from, from uh, a lot of the modules we, that has been sent out during the Corsair course, for instance, or the free OPVs. Uh, all those operations are larger, more complex, enables or has built-in registration and certainly takes a lot longer to clean afterwards. The scale, of course, doesn't end here. Uh, and we're now going to move on, uh, on to a more complex scale, 
and uh, as you've seen now, we've introduced layers and layers and more layers of complexity that all has to be handled by the operator in context with the machine, in context with the product, in order to have a successful application in the end. And as scale grows larger, of course, increasing complexity doesn't end. I mentioned before uh, that there was an alternative to an inline printing machine that had all the printing stations on the same machine. And this is exemplified here, where here we have a roll-to-roll -roll inkjet printer uh, with a uh, photonic sintering unit, hot air oven if needed. There's also here some uh, camera inspection systems for, for film quality control. So you'll notice there's a hole between the machines and this machine can be operated on its own or I can wind the foil after having printed on this machine further on to this machine here, which is a different machine. It's a wet processing unit and also a slot die coating unit. Uh, it also has a hot melt lamination unit. So again, these machines are about the same in complexity as the ones we've seen earlier, but they each have their differences. And of course, stringing them together in a master and slave configuration for true inline processing adds more complexity, not only in the web handling, but certainly also uh, for the operator who has to uh, operate all these machines or several operators that have to work together on these machines to ensure a better product. We can then move up in scale. The next natural step up in scale is the web width. And this we have on this machine, uh, where the web width is now uh, 50 centimeters or 51 centimeters, so nearly double of the other roll coding machines, large roll coding machines I've shown you, either the inline or the master and slave inline processing facility. Now the larger width means that the rolls of foil suddenly are difficult to handle for an ordinary person. So, so whereas for the 305 millimeter web width, you can handle it by hand here, you, you're in a position where it's difficult. Also the machine is larger and this machine that I've shown here uh, has the same capacity. We have edge guide, corona treatment, anti-static, uh, web cleaning, four roller flexor unit. We now also have a UV curing station, UV laminator, a larger roll, uh, rotary screen printer that I'll show in a minute, and also a larger slot die coating head. Now the larger rotary screen printing unit that you see here you recognize it before, it's a little cleaner than the other one, it's been used less. Uh, and partly because, as I mentioned before, that not, not only does scale and complexity go up, so does also the operating costs. So the amount of material you have to put into the machine when you do experiments, the amount of foil, the amount of ink, the amount of operator uh, intensity goes up. The loss you encounter, if you make a mistake, also becomes more costly. And therefore, of course, you have to be pretty sure what you're doing before you go up on the larger scale. And this is also why it makes sense to have a number of machines that gradually increases the scale. That is to manage the cost and the investment in, in operation. Now for this larger rotary screen printer, you'll notice that the printing form is now also suddenly bigger. And just filling this with ink is a costly operation. And therefore, uh, and the cleaning, of course, not to, not to forget, is also more complicated. Now, the final uh, unit over here is slot die coating unit. Uh, you'll notice now that we suddenly have these uh, holders, and this slot die coating head is no longer uh, movable by hand. You need a crane, a small crane, to handle it, not because I cannot physically lift it, but because I cannot lift it and position it correctly on the system without uh, risking damaging, maybe losing balance or something and then damaging the equipment. So we've now moved up to a scale where not only can I not move the machine, I'm starting not to be able to move the printing units and the printing forms. The oven here on this machine is still compact. This has, is a six meter drying length, so very compact uh, hot air oven, also strong infrared heating. And this machine is actually not only scaled in width, it's also scaled in speed and this on this machine you easily run 30 meters a minute and up to 60 meters a minute. And this represents the uh, small, still small laboratory footprint, pretty scaled, half meter width, up to 60 meters a minute. All the printing 
uh, operations that are most meaningful for OPV comprised in one machine. The scale, of course, doesn't end here. We've seen small lab scale, bigger lab scale, bordering pilot scale. And then, of course, real industrial scale is much, much bigger than what can be handled in, in for normal research organization. And this scale that I'm about to show you here is probably where this ends. And the next step up is real industrial scale. It doesn't mean that it's not big. It doesn't mean that it's not expensive to operate or complicated to operate, as you will see. Yeah, so scale here, where you have larger rollers, you are able, capable of handling much larger web width, more complicated uh, structuring, and you can handle more complicated uh, foils like flexible glass or uh, multi-laminates. Uh, uh, of course, th this implies that machinery is heavy, cleaning time is much longer, web handling is much more complicated with a multitude of web guiding units, roller diameters go up, and complexity doesn't stop here. In a real industrial setting, it is much, much comp more complicated. But I should add that in order to go from the spin coder that we've seen, that we, that we all know, and with any hope of reaching the industrial scale, you will need to step through the plethora of machinery that I've shown you today.